Hello, and welcome to the presentation, Infection Prevention Considerations for Critical Care, Picking Up the Pandemic Pieces. Uh, my name is Joan Hebden. I am an independent infection prevention consultant in Baltimore, Maryland. My prior experience uh, has been actually in critical care, uh, having worked uh, in oncology, medicine, as well as open heart recovery. Previously, I was the Director of Infection Prevention and Control at the University of Maryland Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, where we had approximately 10 intensive care units, uh, two of which were in a large trauma center. Uh, I, as I said, have been in infection prevention for quite a long time, uh, almost 30 years, uh, and I wanna take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you and your colleagues for the outstanding work uh, that you have provided to uh, our uh, patients, uh, to your facilities uh, during this extremely challenging time uh, with COVID-19. Many of these patients have been critically ill um, and uh, due to your diligent work, uh, many of them have survived. So I want to shout out a thank you uh, to all of you. My disclosures, I am a consultant for PDI Incorporated. I also am on the Speakers Bureau for Cepheid, uh, which is a company that uh, is molecular diagnostics. Uh, for example, they manufacture a panel uh, that can detect SARS-CoV-2 uh, the virus that causes COVID-19. I also am an infection prevention consultant for Netflix. The objectives for this presentation are identified here for you. We are going to discuss the impact that COVID-19 has had on healthcare associated infection rates in the intensive care unit. I will be referring to these as HAIs uh, for the presentation state the potential contributing factors to these increased HAI rates, and propose infection prevention interventions to mitigate the risk uh, associated with these increased infection rates. Many of you may be familiar with the role of infection preventionists, but I did want to highlight that a decade ago uh, now, uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services initiated a pay for performance program and identified quality metrics that needed to be reported by healthcare facilities. And what I've done here is identify for you that mandated reporting that needs to come from infection preventionists. Uh, you can see that the initial requirement of CMS uh, back in January 2011 and 2012 was identified as critical care units, CLABSI and CAUTI rates. CLABSI standing for central line associated bloodstream infection and CAUTI standing for catheter associated urinary tract infections. It certainly made sense that CMS would focus on critical care units uh, as the first quality metrics, because obviously these patients require invasive devices, central lines, urinary catheters, in order to provide the best possible care to them during their stay. The data that is collected uh, and submitted to the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services is cleared through the National Healthcare Safety Network, um, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control. And this is a domestic tracking and response system to identify emerging and enduring threats across healthcare, such as COVID-19, healthcare associated infections or HAIs, and antibiotic resistant infections. Um, part of this system also includes reporting by rehab facilities, not just acute care settings, 
and has extended into the long-term care setting. Uh, the reason that the data is cleared through a national data tracking system is to ensure that a standardized methodology is utilized for case finding by the infection preventionist, um, as well as surveillance definitions. Um, in the absence of standardization, obviously it would be very difficult to do inter-hospital comparison. And it would be obviously difficult for facilities to identify accurately how well they were doing in comparison to facilities much like their own. So for example, academic medical centers uh, likely have higher infection rates uh, versus smaller community hospitals. Um, and right now there are over 16,000 facilities in the United States that are reporting into this database. I wanted to orient you a bit uh, to the transparency of this data um, and share some information about how well we were doing nationally uh, with some of our HAIs pre-pandemic. If you look at the, at the graph that's here for you, um, you'll see on the y-axis that they're referring to a standardized infection ratio. And this is the way in which the data uh, is calculated. Um, and without going into too much detail about it, I just wanted to mention that this is also a metric that's been used for mortality rates in that you are utilizing what has been observed as an infection rate over what was expected. And the expected rate is a aggregate calculation of data uh, that has been provided nationally um, with the um, sort of average rate being one or average ratio being one. And so if you are less than one, then that means you are doing better than the national average. If you're higher than one, you are doing worse than the, than the national average. So this is actually the metric that if you were to go onto the CMS website and look at their hospital compare data, you would see this being the metric that is used. Um, and you would be able to visualize um, not only um, for a state, but also drilling down to a specific facility what their SIR rates were for the data that's being collected. So here you see four of the metrics that are being reported, catheter-associated UTI, central line-associated bloodstream infections, Clostridium difficile, previously referred to as Clostridium difficile, and methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or MRSA. In the darkened bar, you see where uh, the national aggregate was falling in 2015. In 2015, there was a reworking of some of the regression models that were being used for calculation of SIR. And so uh, 2019, we have a bit of a different calculation um, in terms of some of these rates based on changes to definitions or changing to testing methods. But actually what we um, have observed um, is that there was a very nice downward trend for all of these uh, HAIs um, where you can see um, for Clostaroides difficile, a 42% reduction, 18% um, for MRSA, and this is bacteremia only for MRSA, um, and then approximately 30% for Clapsi and Caudi. So we were very encouraged about this data. Um, the recommendations uh, that 
we receive as professionals in infection control um, come generally from the CDC and from our professional organizations, the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, which is abbreviated as SHEA, and the Association for Infection Pro Control Professionals, uh, and that is called APIC. Um, they, the strategies that we recommend to clinicians to reduce HAIs are coming from evidence-based literature that has been reviewed by these groups, and they then issue guidance documents and recommendations based on the strength of the evidence. Uh, CDC has a committee called HICPAC, or Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee, and they have multidisciplinary representation for uh, the criteria uh, that they're going to use um, to either develop a new definition for an HAI or to revise or modify a definition. So for example, um, years ago, we calculated for ventilator-associated pneumonia, which had a specific standardized definition. And then there was so much pushback from the clinicians about that definition that CDC convened a multidisciplinary group, which actually included representation from AACN, uh, to revisit how we were going to track and trend the infections that were occurring in the lower respiratory tract when patients were ventilated. And so the definition actually changed for adults to what was called ventilator-associated events. I bring that up only as an example of how the collaboration with clinicians has evolved over the years with CDC's NHSN team um, because they want to make absolutely certain that the clinicians find the definitions to be valid and reliable since those rates that are the outcome of using those definitions are going to be a quality metric not only for reporting to our regulatory agencies but also will be tracked internally um, for you know incentivizing uh, the clinical staff to do better or to reward them for doing great. Um, the other thing I want to mention um, about the recommendations for preventing HAIs uh, at what we call prevention bundles, and we're going to talk about a few of those um, toward the end of the presentation, is that the actual implementation of those prevention bundles is really the role of the clinical staff, all of you. Many of you may be in an intensive care unit where you have a physician and perhaps a nurse, it could be one of you, that serve as champions around ensuring that evidence-based practices are being followed and that compliance, if it is not being done as, as well as you would like, um, is discussed in your quality committees uh, in terms of workflow modifications that could be made. Uh, do you need uh, to have a kit for supplies developed in order to ensure that best practices are followed? Um, there are some intensive care units that do line rounds um, to ensure that central lines are not staying in longer than they need to be. Uh, these um, process measures um, are being monitored very closely um, along with the outcome measure, which is of course the HAI rates. Um, and all of you are critical uh, in terms of assisting with that monitoring and brainstorming strategies to improve processes if necessary. 
So it looked as if we were doing pretty well pre-pandemic with our HAI rates. So what impact has COVID-19 actually had on HAI rates uh, in the intensive care unit? And I just want to point out that this data is evolving. There was a survey that was conducted by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology uh, not that long ago. Uh, and this was an online survey. It was uh, sent out to uh, over a thousand infection preventionists uh, for the time period of October 22nd through November 5th, 2020. The respondents, uh, along with being asked questions about the availability of personal protective equipment, were asked which HAIs had increased during the pandemic. And you can see here that of the respondents, and I believe there was about a 73% response rate to the survey, that nearly 28% noted that their clapses had increased and 21% noted that their caudies had increased. So let's take a look at uh, what the evidence is showing us around whether this holds true or not. In terms of papers that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, these three papers uh, were up to date through March 18th of this year. There will be other papers, probably many papers, um, that will follow this. And we'll, we'll talk about each one of these. So the first paper that I wanted to highlight is by Faki and colleagues. Uh, this is part of the Ascension Health uh, System. And there was a retrospective evaluation of 78 hospitals within this particular uh, system. And so what they did is they took 12 months worth of data uh, from March 2019 through February 2020, uh, which was pre-pandemic, and compared it to six months worth of data during the pandemic of March through August of 2020. And what they observed was that CLAPSI rates increased by 51% during the first six months of the pandemic compared to the prior 12 months. And this increase was mainly observed in the ICUs uh, where the increase was 71%. The larger hospitals that had greater than 300 beds were the most affected. The average time to CLAPSI from the COVID-19 diagnosis was 18 days. That's a long time. Uh, and again, when we get into looking at some of the potential risk factors, I'll refer back to this in terms of the duration of catheterization. Uh, as well as some of the strategies that were needed in order to improve oxygenation uh, in the critical care patient population. The patients with COVID had greater than five times more collapses than patients without COVID-19. So again, one paper uh, that is really giving us hard data about collapses. In addition, this paper gave us some information around the microbiology associated with collapses. We saw that gram-positive organisms causing collapse increased by 81%. Now, bear in mind that gram-positive organisms such as coagulase-negative staphylococci, staph aureus, enterococci, these organisms do in fact produce the majority of CLAPSI infections. But one thing that they found was that coag negative staphylococci, which is actually skin flora, all of us have it on our skin, increased by 130%. So that sort of raised their eyebrows a bit. And they also saw an increase in yeast, BSI caused by candida species with an increase of, of, of nearly 57%. I will cite a couple 
contributing factors that they mentioned in their paper, and we'll re revisit this later in the talk. But one of the reasons for the significant increase in coagulase negative staphylococci is actually because they felt there could have been suboptimal blood culturing practice. And that led to blood culture contamination uh, with skin flora. In addition, they mentioned that the increase in candida species, BSIs, was likely due to the use of broad spectrum antimicrobial and, uh, pressure, meaning that these individuals were so sick that they were giving them broad spectrum antimicrobials to ensure that they didn't get secondary bacterial infections. And that in and of itself can lead to the increase in yeast as well as multidrug resistant organism uh, infections. And again, remember that I mentioned the 18 days from uh, the diagnosis to the onset of CLATSI. Uh, they also felt that the prolonged use of central lines was a contributing factor. Another paper uh, that has been published uh, about the pandemic collateral damage relating to CLAPSIs is out of Detroit. Uh, this is an academic tertiary medical center. This was, again, a retrospective cohort study. They have a pre and post pandemic time period with the COVID period um, that included patients with and without COVID-19 being January through May uh, of 2019. And then you have your post-pandemic period of January through May of 2020. What they observed is that uh, post-pandemic, the average monthly collapse rate increased uh, to 1.7 per 1,000 central line days. And you may uh, note, note that this is how the data generally is reported within your facility. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why device day information is collected about who has a central line or who has a urinary catheter, because that becomes your denominator uh, for the calculation of these rates. Um, and actually, pre-pandemic, uh, they had a rate of 0.4 per 1,000 central line days. So a statistically significant increase of 325%. The other thing they noted, uh, much uh, like Fakiz and his colleagues mentioned, is that blood culture contamination rates uh, during uh, the uh, COVID period were 19% greater. Uh, and so this again was statistically significant when you're looking at uh, an increase from pre-pandemic of 3.2% to 3.8%. And just to give you a perspective on that, you want to have blood culture contamination rates ideally at zero. Um, but if you look at the literature, most people will target less than 3% uh, for blood culture contamination rates. Many, many hospitals ha have been able to drive that down to less than 1% um, based on some new technology uh, in the marketplace. This is a paper uh, that was just published in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology, which is the Shea Journal, um, where Patel and colleagues actually analyzed the National Healthcare Safety Network data uh, for CLAPSI uh, early in the, in the, in the pandemic. Um, so they included all of the US hospitals who were voluntarily submitting CLAPSI data so we were looking at 936 acute care hospitals having been part of this analysis. And you have your pre-COVID cohort, which was April to June of 2019, versus your COVID cohort of April to June 2020. 
So essentially, you're 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 comparing the same quarter of data, uh, which is what you would want want to be doing. Uh, the findings uh, they saw a 28% increase in the national standardized infection ratio, uh, where it went from 0 0.68 in 2019 to 0 0.87 in 2020. Uh, again, this is is you know better. Uh, then one, uh, remember that I said that the average would be one for a standardized infection ratio, um, but still an increase. And that, again, the intensive care units saw the greatest SIR increase um, of 39%. Um, they also noted that there was an increase in device utilization. Uh, and this is not surprising uh, in that uh, we would expect uh, that with the intensive care units being completely full uh, with COVID-19 patients in some uh, facilities that they would all have central lines uh, during their, their stay. The CLAPSI reporting also dropped by 17% nationally during this time period. And I did want to note that this was an exemption by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. They were aware that infection preventionists were overwhelmed uh, with trying to assist clinical staff, not only in protecting themselves, uh, but also protecting other patients from uh, transmission of COVID-19. Uh, they were struggling with ensuring that the clinicians had personal protective equipment. Uh, so surveillance, which generally would be prospective, meaning that they would be doing it daily rather than attempting to go backward and collect the data, uh, really went to the wayside. And it was recognized by the professional organizations of Shea and APIC um, that this was occurring. And so there actually was a solicitation to CMS uh, about having a, the period of uh, April to June 2020 uh, not used uh, for the purposes of, of reporting uh, because they really felt that the data would not be as accurate. And so what about the pandemic collateral damage related to catheter-associated UTI? There really is not strong evidence uh, at this time, uh, even though you will recall that there was a perceived increase in quantities by the infection preventionists who were surveyed. Uh, these two papers that were summarized by Michael Stevens recently at the National Shea Conference uh, would suggest that there has not been a significant change in CAUTI rate. Uh, the first paper that you see here was a uh, retrospective uh, cohort study. Again, they had a pre-COVID uh, cohort versus a COVID cohort. Um, this was actually in Singapore uh, and included uh, the 1,785 bed general hospital and some other uh, specialist centers in the same system. Um, and interestingly, they noted a increased compliance with the bundle practices for prevention of CAUTI, which I will hi highlight with you uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, another retrospective cohort study that was conducted um, looking um, at 78 hospitals from a single healthcare system in the United States where there was actually 12 uh, states represented represented it. This is Dr. Uh, Faki and colleagues paper uh, from Ascension Health. Uh, they did not see a significant change in CAUTI rate either. Uh, there um, were quite a significant number of urinary catheter days, uh, nearly uh, 820,000 uh, that were looked at. Uh, and so again, we need more, more data. 
One paper that I was able to find, which I'm sure you all would be interested in uh, because of the number of patients that require ventilator assistance uh, while they're in your units, uh, is this retrospective observational study. This was out of a single academic teaching hospital. They had 18, I'm sorry, 81 COVID-19 and 144 non-COVID-19 patients uh, that were receiving invasive ventilation between March 15th and August 30th of 2020. Um, the patients with COVID-19 had a higher incidence of microbiologically confirmed uh, VAP or ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, which was 48% uh, of, of that population um, compared to 19 patients without COVID-19. Uh, these patients uh, with COVID were significantly more likely to develop uh, VAP than patients without COVID. You can see that the hazard ratio uh, was 2.01, uh, highly statistically significant. So they were twice as likely to develop VAP uh, than non-COVID patients. Uh, the Looking at the incidence density, uh, and, and, and again, this is, is uh, new days, not cumulative days, but each new day of ventilation, uh, the incident density was 28 per 1,000 ventilator days uh, for COVID patients versus 13 days per 1,000 ve uh, ventilator days for patients without COVID-19. Um, they did not see any real difference in the microbiology responsible for VAP uh, for COVID-19 patients compared to the patients in the unit ventilated for other reasons. This is really the only paper that I could find that had looked at ventilator-associated pneumonia. But as we know, this is a very serious HAI, um, and I'm sure there will be more data uh, being uh, produced in the literature. So let's move to the next objective, state the potential contributing factors to these increased HAI rates. And there are a number of them that have been cited. Uh, and I'm sure that you will recognize um, all of them uh, if you've been dealing with patients uh, with COVID-19 in your intensive care units. High patient acuity of these patients. Clearly these patients have stayed in hospitals for months, uh, many of them in the intensive care unit for weeks. And so this longer length of hospitalization certainly puts them at risk for the development of healthcare associated infections. Uh, duration of hospitalization is definitely known as a risk factor for HAIs. The other significant contributing factor that has been mentioned is the need for prone positioning of these patients to improve oxygenation. So having them prone uh, certainly enhances the expansion of their lungs, but the downside is, is that the central line insertion site would have decreased visualization. Um, in addition, third spacing of fluid may have compromised dressing integrity. And the frequency of dressing changes with this population may have, have been decreased. The overall increase in the seriousness of general acutely ill patients. And this would have been due to the fact that people delayed care, uh, did not want to go into healthcare settings for fear of contracting COVID-19. So when they present it to the emergency room or to their doctor's office or to a ambulatory setting for care, they were much sicker. Um, so again, along with your COVID-19 patient population, uh, the other patients that required attention uh, were very sick. Patient surges and subsequent increase in patients needing ICU care um, led to adjusted staffing to meet the demanding needs of these patients. So you may have seen in your facility 
a movement of perhaps emergency room nurses or recovery room nurses uh, because of the decrease in elective surgeries that were being performed, being mobilized into the ICU to help with staffing. Uh, there may have been inadequate mentoring. Uh, they may have been doing things differently in terms of processes of care uh, than you were familiar with in your unit. Uh, so again, this could very well be contributing to the increased HAI rates that we're seeing. The other thing that may have contributed, uh, and I just want to take a moment to explain this, is that there was a reduction in diagnostic imaging being performed um, because obviously people in the ICU that were in charge of the patient, uh, if it couldn't be a portable imaging study, they would be hesitant to send the patient out of the unit to other locations uh, due to the potential for uh, environmental contamination, due to the potential for uh, surface contamination uh, by the hands of healthcare personnel transporting. And so these studies are important for infection preventionists because there could be a secondary source of infection that we would utilize uh, for someone who has a central line in place. So for example, um, if there was a diagnostic imaging study that was gonna pick up a small interabdominal abscess, for example, um, and that was not done, um, and the patient ended up having a bloodstream infection, and of course they've got a central line in. If we cannot identify a secondary source of infection, that would be considered a clapsy. So uh, the reduction in diagnostic imaging could have skewed the clapsy rate higher. Nursing practice changes. So uh, there were, as you very well know, um, a limitation placed on the frequency in which people would go into the patient rooms. Uh, but, you know, they would try to batch care, essentially. And so we saw medication pumps, dialysis machines that were placed in hallways. Um, there could have been contamination uh, as a result of tubing being on the floor, uh, the addition of extension sets, that kind of thing. In addition, uh, the reduction of time in the patient room may have impacted hand hygiene, uh, tubing and vascular access site maintenance, as we've already mentioned, uh, disinfection of needleless access connectors prior to accessing vascular devices. In addition, uh, universal decolonization, uh, which has been practiced uh, in many organizations uh, to uh, reduce the potential for staph aureus infections, uh, utilizing either uh, a povidone iodine or an alcohol-based uh, nasal uh, application of product, as well as the use of chlorhexidine gluconate uh, bathing for skin decolonization, it may have been that these uh, practices were not, were not done because of competing priorities. And then as I mentioned, uh, CMS waived uh, the reporting of HAIs due to the increased demands that COVID placed on the infection interventionist. So the reduced attention to HAI may have made it difficult uh, to recognize that there was an upper trend in rates. The other thing that was mentioned recently at the Shea conference, uh, I just wanted to mention because I think it's exceedingly important is the socio-behavioral factors um, that uh, may uh, have contributed um, to increased HAIs. 
And here you see that, again, it mentions the changes in resources, but I did want to mention the change in attitudes um, and the balancing of risk that all of you and your colleagues um, were doing, you know, on a minute to minute, hour to hour basis. Um, the exhaustion, uh, the emotion of having to have patients pass away without any family members near them, uh, trying to comfort those patients. Um, the stories are endless about how nurses uh, were attempting to not replace, but be a substitute uh, for family members not being there. And again, thank you all uh, for that. But the burnout uh, rate, I think we are going to see, there are going to be people leaving the field uh, after this pandemic. Uh, it has been exhausting. You can see the fatigue on healthcare workers' faces. Um, and again, the emotional burden um, has been huge. And the last objective is proposed infection prevention interventions to mitigate these increased HAI rates. So what can we do? One of the things that I'm going to highlight through this last portion of the presentation is getting back to basics. But I did want to point out that there's one paper uh, out of Singapore uh, that is, again, a retrospective cohort study where they did not see an increase in the rate uh, of infections um, and it, it, the CLAPSIs I'm, I'm referring to here. Uh, this is the same facility uh, that I mentioned earlier, a uh, very large hospital, 1,700 beds. And they had their pre-cohort period being January 2018 to January 2020. So you've got you know, a period of, of two years there. And then the COVID period was February 1 of 2020 through August 31st of 2020. And during the COVID period, um, they actually saw a decrease um, in their CLAPSI incidence, which was statistically significant. And recall that uh, Singapore had a lot of experience previously with our initial coronavirus uh, epidemic, uh, the SARS epidemic in 2003. And so they had adopted very early on the aggressive prevention bundle practices uh, which included universal masking and adequate uh, PPE access uh, pre the COVID-19 pandemic. And they actually observed an increase in the prevention bundle adherence. And so that's where I want to focus in terms of mitigation and prevention of HAI rates going forward is that we need to get back to the basics of these prevention bundles. In addition to that, we need to have the infection preventionist refocus on prospective surveillance for healthcare associated infections instead of looking back retrospectively. The purpose of prospective surveillance is early identification of the infection and then actually being able to do a real-time root cause analysis. Um, and many of you may have participated in these processes of, of looking at what may have led to the infection. Uh, what we've done uh, at the University of Maryland um, is again, the, the nurse champion uh, and the physician champion are included in uh, rounding um, on the patients that have been identified with HAIs. Um, and again, there's been a drill down into detail as it relates to how was the line inserted? Uh, is it being assessed each day for necessity? 
uh, how are dressing changes being done, what are people doing around uh, accessing needleless connectors. Um, and so, again, we haven't been able to do that. People have simply been too busy to do that. So we want to see a movement back where there is a dialogue occurring between the infection preventionist and the clinicians. A continued monitoring of the prevention bundle practices uh, needs to occur, and then ensuring that decolonization strategies are being adhered to. And again, here I'd be talking about both nasal and skin decolonization strategies. I want to highlight what I mean by back to basics in, in preventing each of these different HAIs. So for CLABSIS, we know that using maximal barrier precautions at insertion is critical. And there have been checklists created in order to do that. Make sure that someone is in the room assisting the operator and making sure that everything is in place. Bathing patients in the ICU that are greater than two months of age with chlorhexidine on a daily basis. There is very strong data suggesting that this, in fact, does prevent collapse. Using ultrasound guidance uh, for internal jugular catheter insertion is another practice that uh, is endorsed, uh, as well as uh, ensuring an appropriate nurse to patient ratio in ICUs. And I was particularly proud of Shea to include this in their prevention uh, compendium for CLABSI, because many times I've heard that a resident goes into a cubicle to insert a central line, may or may not have gone searching for the nurse who was caring for the patient, or they did and the nurse could not do it at that time, so they just go ahead and do it on their own. Um, I think that uh, there's been obviously a stretching of this nurse to patient ratio during this pandemic. Uh, and as I alluded to, that could be a contributing risk factor uh, to us seeing the higher CLABSI rates. Um, the uh, other thing that I want to highlight here um, is the optimal catheter site selection. I think uh, you all know the subclavian is preferred. And as I said, that could have led uh, to the lack of visibility of that site. Uh, or there could have been a movement away from the jugular, uh, internal jugular or subclavian, uh, where they may have actually been using the femoral site. Uh, due to the emergent need for placement of a central line. Um, and then the daily review of line necessity, which can be done during rounds. Uh, decolonization to prevent Staph aureus bloodstream infection. Uh, this is considered a core strategy from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, and this is for all patients admitted to ICUs. Uh, there is the recommendation not only for daily chlorhexidine bathing, um, but also the application of either intranasal mepuricin or an iodophore uh, for uh, the uh, bundle uh, practice. So, combination of a nasal decolonizing agent plus a skin decolonizing agent, very strong data uh, that this will reduce the incidence of bloodstream infections overall, not just central line associated bloodstream infections. Um, and then uh, I wanted to highlight a paper uh, that I thought was very well done uh, that was presented a couple years ago uh, at a Shea conference um, where they had decided that they were going to discontinue contact precautions for MRSA. And they did that 
by simultaneously implementing a one-time application of nasal provodone iodine and daily 2% chlorhexidine gluconate, uh, which was applied with a prepregnated wipe in their adult ICU patient populations. Um, during this time, they did both admission and weekly screening for MRSA, as well as multi-drug resistant gram-negative bacteria, uh, such as carbapenonase resistant uh, Enterobacteraceae. And their objective is really to determine whether or not this intervention would have an impact on acquisition of these MDROs in their adult ICUs. And their results are here for you. I'll also show you this graphically. But they saw the acquisition rate for MRSA alone fall 51%. Uh, the colonization rate, and again, remember colonization implies the presence of the organism without infection, fell 51%. And their infection rate fell 44%. When they looked at CRE alone, the acquisition rate fell 90%, colonization rate by 94%, and the infection rate by 75%. And a total of 11 healthcare-associated MRSA or CRE infections were estimated to have been prevented, eight MRSA and three CRE. Um, and this uh, actually shows you graphically for MRSA and CRE, um, you know, the how these rates um, for the pre-year period when they were using contact precautions versus year two um, with their universal uh, chlorhexidine bathing and nasal decolonization um, without contact precautions, they still uh, were able to achieve this significant reduction. Uh, in the number of healthcare-associated MRSA and CRE colonizations and infections. Let's talk briefly about strategies to prevent catheter-associated urinary tract infection. And again, I think you all are familiar with these just to review, back to basics. We don't put catheters in patients unless they're absolutely necessary. Um, once they are placed, we need to maintain awareness that they're in. So asking again a physician, is it still necessary for us to have this catheter in? Now, I understand in intensive care units that measuring our hourly output is exceedingly important, uh, difficult to do without a urinary catheter in place. But again, you know, if the patient is going to be transitioning out, uh, getting that catheter removed as soon as possible, and then the proper care of the catheters, ensuring that meato care is performed um, as dictated by your, your hospital protocol. Getting rid of the catheter, as I said, and preventing catheter replacement. Um, and again, these are the core elements uh, that uh, we would like to see practiced. Uh, and one other thing that, that I would say uh, that um, is gaining some popularity uh, is the use of, uh, you know, non-invasive uh, non urinary measurement technology. As far as the prevention of ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, this is a table that was put together by Klompus and colleagues. Uh, it's a few years old, but, you know, it pretty much um, is one that I think is, is important uh, to take a look at. Uh, and you can see here, if it's a dark green arrow, uh, it's going to be probable for reducing uh, the elements that are across the top of the table. So the duration of ventilation, pneumonia, atelectasis, ARDS, and fluid overload. Um, the uh, non-shaded arrow evidence is from observational studies only uh, or inconsistent uh, randomized control trial data. So paying attention to the darkened uh, arrows 
uh, minimizing sedation is going to assist with reducing the duration of ventilation. And we know that the longer that someone is ventilated, the higher the risk for them to develop pneumonia. Sedation, vacations, um, these, you know, uh, and, and trials um, to try to get the patient weaned as soon as possible, again, uh, will impact duration of ventilation and therefore the development of pneumonia and ARDS. Early mobility, low tidal volume ventilation um, has definitely been shown to reduce pneumonia, atelectasis, and ARDS. Conservative fluid management, um, and this has the most impact obviously on the length of ventilation as well as fluid overload. And then conservative uh, transfusion thresholds impact on pneumonia, ARDS, fluid overload. So, you know, bearing these strategies in mind, we need to get back into the prevention bundle for VAP, particularly around reduction of the days of ventilation, um, as well as these other strategies. I also wanted to mention uh, something around needleless connector decontamination for preventing uh, central line associated infections. Um, this is a recently published randomized controlled trial. Uh, it only included 180 patients, um, but the outcome was central line associated bloodstream infection. Um, they used actually three different products uh, for the decontamination of the connector. Uh, there were 61 patients that had just alcohol, al alcohol alone used. Uh, this was a 70% alcohol wipe. Uh, there were 59 who had uh, a cap uh, used uh, that again was a 70% alcohol. And then 58 patients had a wipe used that was 2% chlorhexidine gluconate in 70% alcohol. And what they found is that there was a 2% rate of CLAPSI with both the alcohol wipe and the cap versus no CLAPSIs associated with the use of chlorhexidine and alcohol wipes. Um, they note that you know, the larger trials are needed, um, but I would point out uh, that in Europe, uh, particularly in the UK, uh, they do have a specific guideline uh, for the use of chlorhexidine and alcohol as the disinfectant agent for needleless connectors. So we need more data here in the U.S. to have this be a Category 1 recommendation, um, but just, again, a piece of data supporting that. Um, I thought this was an interesting paper for you to take a look at. What the nursing staff didn't know as it related to reducing blood culture contamination rates. Um, this particular facility, as you can see, uh, was having higher than they wanted uh, contaminated blood cultures. Um, they uh, decided that they were going to create three evidence-based nursing protocols in conjunction with the infection prevention program and, and, and the lab for blood culture collection. Uh, and this was from a central venous catheter from a new peripheral IV or with a peripheral blood draw. And when those policies were put into place, and again, I mentioned earlier that this threshold of 3% for a contamination rate uh, has been widely cited but clearly we'd like to see uh, these contamination rates be much lower than that. Uh, unfortunately, when you have a contaminated blood culture, uh, many times those patients are treated with antibiotics as well as um, potentially having uh, infections related to the use of a peripheral IV for longer than it's needed or a central line. Um, and what 
they learned uh, during this, this time period um, is that there was a significant lack of knowledge by nursing staff about the protocols uh, using chlorhexidine for skin prep, uh, the need for them to disinfect the bottle tops uh, for in injection uh, of the blood. Many people think they can just pop that plastic cap off and they don't have to disinfect the rubber stopper. Removal and change of the needleless connector, that should be done if you're going to be drawing a blood culture through a line and then scrubbing the hub of the central venous catheter. You know, this, these are basics that our bedside nursing staff didn't know. And again, this is not out of an intensive care nursing population per se, but I know that all of you are likely to be drawing blood cultures. And so it is really important um, that we recognize um, that um, the majority of these contaminated blood cultures were associated with non-lab personnel drawing them. Uh, the lab had a blood culture collection protocol, which they were adhering to, but nursing did not. And they found that education and champions of uh, this particular performance improvement project were important. Um, this is a paper out of an emergency room setting with a quality improvement intervention to reduce blood culture contamination. And here, um, they, their objective was um, to reduce blood culture contamination in their 207-bed uh, teaching hospital uh, for ER patients. Um, and they did a pre-post quasi-experimental retrospective study, quasi-experimental meaning just that you have a period where you have no intervention, you implement the intervention, and then you collect data after. And the intervention is cited here for you. They got a dedicated team of, of lead nurses and paramedics. They were trained by the lead phlebotomist uh, to perform all the, the draws in the ER. Um, the infectious disease physician and the infection preventionist provided educational materials to the trainees, and they did have a pre-assembled kit. Uh, and this has been actually my experience as an IP for some reason, um, kits are not necessarily desirable by ER staff. Uh, many of them would prefer to have a cart where they've got you know, all their, their stuff on there and they can pick and choose what they want. Um, but you know, it clearly is a way to improve practice. And so here you see their results that during the baseline period, um, they had a contamination rate of nearly 4%. Um, and then after the intervention, um, this dropped down to 1%, which was highly statistically significant. Um, and they concluded, you know, that their standardized process uh, resulted in a sustained reduction in their contamination rates. So in summary, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic shifted the priorities of an infection preventionist, resulting in delayed surveillance and evaluation of HAIs, resulting in increased rates, particularly for collapses. The contributing factors were multifactorial, uh, debriefing with the clinical staff about potential reasons for these increased HAIs and discussing strategies to mitigate risk is strongly recommended and refocusing the attention back to basics. Hand hygiene, the prevention bundle monitoring, prospective surveillance is a must for infection preventionist in collaboration with all of you. Um, and lastly, I would just like uh, to end by saying that um, I appreciate your attention um, and I would refer you um, to the PDI booth um, for uh, the exhibiting of some of their products uh, that have been uh, shown uh, to reduce uh, outcome metrics um, and also to improve the processy 
uh, of uh, reduction strategies. Um, and 